Orchestration can be defined as the art of selecting and arranging particular instruments to achieve a particular sound for a piece of music. In order to do this, we must learn more about the instruments involved. Since no orchestra is really complete without strings, we figured that's a good place to start. You're listening to Music Student 101. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. All right, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, my friend. How are you doing in this new year? I'm good, I'm good. As good as can be. And honestly, actually, I feel pretty great. It's a good day. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because <laughs> I'm talking about music. Maybe it's because we're back. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe because we're talking about music. Well, you know, hey, when it's a good day, it, j just enjoy that it is a good day. Don't, uh, <laughs> you know, don't, don't peek behind the curtain too much. <laughs> don't overanalyze it. <laughs> right. Um, and yourself, Matt. We are still making it. We are still uh, plodding along. Uh, my next fully online semester will start in just a few days. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's a little less daunting this time, just because I kind of feel like I know what what it's going to be like. You know, having already done one semester of of nothing but online classes. So, uh huh. Uh, uh, this time around, uh, you know, maybe uh, have a little bit of the benefit of experience, but. Hmm. Uh, otherwise, you know, life carries on. We're looking forward to the end of this time. Yes, sir. Towards the end of the last episode, um, we talked about um, the possibility, or, or that maybe we're at the point where we should really start talking about orchestration. Mm hmm. Yes. And um, in my mind, we talked about composition, but this is not the same thing, right? This is. Uh... Right. Yeah. So, not exactly the same thing. Um, Orchestration is the art of choosing instruments for what you want to write mm -hmm. and writing your music for those instruments in not only a practical way or what we call an idiomatic way, meaning, um, you know, uh, well suited to those particular instruments, but also in an artful and creative way and in a way that enhances you know, some internal aspect of the music that you feel needs to be brought out, you know, or, or that you feel to be important. Uh, good orchestration helps you get your musical point across. And it, and it is the, the writing for specific instruments. And of course, that includes uh, composition, sort of, this, the two ideas are sort of entwined, but that also includes arranging, you know, or, you know, uh, really even if it's orchestration by word of mouth you know i mean what the bass player is going to do versus what the guitar player is going to do you know I mean, um mm. e even if that's a pretty a purely verbally communicated kind of orchestration rather than on the page and of course if you if you want to be uh john williams and write you know big orchestral scores for epic epic blockbuster movies you're going to need to know some of this stuff right yeah <laughs> And after a few listener compositions episodes, we're learning that we do have a few people out there, listeners out there who are working on that level, you know. Oh, sure. Oh, blowing sure. Blowing my yeah. mind. And, you know, we can we can dip a little bit of a toe in here and, and see uh, see the, the reaction we get. You know, I mean, it, it is an in is a lifelong pursuit orchestration. Uh huh. Um, one of the big faulty assumptions people make about it, I think, is is they think that it's just a, it's sort of a list of do's and don'ts and best practices, and and once you learn that, uh, you're set. You just you just go in and, and apply those that those do's and don'ts and best practices, and and you know everything else is about the music you write. When in fact, orchestration is itself a high art and one that you spend a lifetime uh dealing with and perfecting and 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 uh finding your own voice in you know so not to mention we try not to do do's and don'ts don't we we really don't do do's and don'ts no we mm. uh, our concept of music theory isn't really based on do's and don'ts you know it, it is based on making observations about what may make music that we like yes 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 well, let's see here. 
I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, just going over your lecture notes. This is one of your classes. Did I, is this, do you teach an entire course on orchestration? I do. Okay. And so this, this is almost like you guys have the pleasure to step inside the classroom <laughs> of the most awesome Dr. Phillips. For considerably less money than uh, most people have to pay <laughs> and, and <laughs> to I do will, that. I will try and represent you guys as best as I can by raising my hand on occasion and asking the questions that uh, that I have. <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, and speaking of money, we have a Patreon page. We do. Let's get into our little social part here, because I think, you know, yeah. norm normally we do reviews and then Patreon and then listener mail. But uh, since this Patreon patron... Uh, segue so well into the episode, we're going to go ahead and do our reviews first and then our listener mail. Okay. Who cares about the order, that kind of stuff? Who cares? Ah, order, order. Let's get into it, shall we? Let's do. Okay, so we have a new review. Um, relatively new anyways. We're just going down the list chronologically as, I, as we do episodes here. But mm -hmm. our most recent um, discussed review is from a friend named Felixall01. Felix yes. What do they have to say? OL01, it looks like. Uh huh. Five stars, huh? Five stars. Thank you, Felix. They say this is a very relaxed way to learn music. They say <laughs> this, is, this is the first time that I've listened to this podcast. Very entertaining. Keep up the good work. Excellent. Thank you very much. Short and sweet, man. Um, yep. And then we have another one here from another five star review from She the Banshee. Matt, you want to. You want to take that one? Absolutely. This person says, so thankful. I've been teaching myself music for years. I only knew some basic theory, and I knew I had to push myself to thoroughly understand music theory. This podcast has helped me so much, and you guys are so enjoyable to listen to as well. It's much appreciated. Uh, I feel like you guys are old friends, and finally getting to speak the language of music is just so wonderful. Mm. Also, kinds of give me some courage to want to go to college. <laughs> Been having cold feet forever. That wasn't that cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words. And, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, go to college. It's not that scary. I promise. And I want to say, Matt, we met each other in 1998, 1997. <laughs> yeah. So, cut, cut that <laughs> out. Yeah. Beep. <laughs> Lest we just close our yeah yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna beep over that yeah nineteen yeah <laughs> <laughs> but we met each other at college yeah so you know a testament to the fact that you make lifelong friends there mm hmm mm hmm um, um that was a really cool review and I, I kind of dig the name she the banshee she the I, banshee being yeah. in a, playing Irish Not music bad. for almost as long as I've known Matt I've been playing Irish music and um I love the folklore the banshee is a is a um one of the mythical creatures of Irish folklore. Yeah. I think, I think known for its screaming, if, uh, if memory serves. Indeed. Uh, torture people with its wails and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. What else was I going to say? Uh, but yeah, uh, speaking the language of music, that, mm. is, uh, that is one of our goals, is to sort of be your music language translator, right? Yep, because it is a little bit of a of a of a language. It, there, there are terms and terminologies and, and things that are by you know they're, they're probably their most practical function it is to provide a way of communicating musical concepts that you wouldn't have otherwise. You know? Sure, absolutely. Not just uh, not just C major and G minor, although that's a that's a rudimentary example of it. But you know, a kind of thing like dominant function is is. You know, describing a, a a concept that exists in music that you know, with, without without you knowing that language, you wouldn't really know how to talk about that concept. Oh yeah, we're not just trying to right. sound smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks again, uh, Felix All O One and She the Banshee for your reviews. What Indeed. do those do? Thank Th you. Those help us out a lot. Um, they, it just boosts our presence and lets more people know about it. You know? Indeed, yes. No, more people know about the show, more music education gets out there. And that's the idea. That's the idea. Now on to our listener mail. Another short and sweet one, and then uh, and then we'll get into one from our friend Nancy here. What? Mm -hmm. But first, what does Zach Pependick have to say? Zach says, uh, Augmented reminds me of when Gilligan gets hit on the head with a coconut and wakes up with amnesia. <laughs> you guys <laughs> rock. I've been... 
listening all day while I do deliveries. Well, thank you so much, Zach. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> glad to, glad to make your delivery route a little a uh, little more entertaining. Yeah, uh, the when he gets hit with amnesia, uh, <laughs> the augmented <laughs> cord is a subset of the whole tone scale if i'm thinking correctly and I, and i believe i am yeah and and that and, and that's the scale that uh they always used to use on those old tv movies for like flashbacks and and for weird stuff happening people getting hit on the head and getting amnesia which happened on gilligan's island and the adams family and basically every other show they they yeah. yeah they always used to use that that scale that has an augmented cord in it so so yeah uh definitely a good association you know you think that because that's what they used <laughs> and the augmented chord for example it's the stacking of major thirds right so if we're doing g we have a a g and then another major third up we have a b and then another major third up we have uh c i'm sorry d sharp d, d sharp, sharp yeah and then uh, by the time you add another major third you're back at g all right it's a symmetrical chord mm-hmm if you notice that, because it's all major thirds all the way around, so yeah, uh, yes, funny. Um, but yeah, that's that. That's that weird little little sound they used all over the place and for for things like that. But anytime a listener writes in and gives a good example of what some of these chords and scales sound like, it's I, I love to share it because it's it helps me. It's it's you know it's just a cool thing. You know. Oh sure. Can only help. Yeah. Now. Our last episode, 94, we did on instrument care uh, for brass mm -hmm. instruments. And now, as neither of us were really well-versed on the topic of physically taking care of these instruments, as we've never played them, <laughs> All right. I, I researched as much as I could and came up with some cleaning tips from Yamaha.com and right. a few other places, a few other um, sources. But we also asked for some listener feedback because uh, there were one or two things that, were a little, that we were just a little bit confused by, you know? Mm -hmm. So our old friend Nancy Mitchell, who is um, a songwriter and also a trumpet player, emailed us with a couple of notes. So you want to hear what she has to say? Absolutely. Okay, first off, the mouthpiece. Now, this is interesting. I think this is kind of important, and I don't remember if we covered this. Nancy says, I have recently learned that it may have lead in it. So if the, if the rim is worn, replace it or have it replated with gold or silver. Yeah, lead not necessarily a good thing apparently uh some brass is alloyed with two percent lead uh i think some of the reasons i saw were machinability hmm. it's a softer metal but uh these aren't the kind of things that they put that people put in their mouths <laughs> right if you have a mouthpiece on your uh brass instrument and it is showing wear wear or tear where there's an exposed brass then you might consider instead of gold or silver you might mm -hmm. consider just getting a new mouthpiece or having it replated hmm. Interesting stuff, huh? Now, yeah, absolutely. I think the uh, twelve-year-olds came out in us when we were talking about the spit valves. <laughs> I recounted a funny story about that, and she says, yeah. "She says for clarification, yes, we brass player. We were wondering about um, when and when they when and where they empty those things." Right, right, right. Yeah. She says, "Yes, we brass players empty the spit onto the floor, although." I have, over more recent years, seen other brass players bring a small container for their spit. <laughs> I think I, I can't decide which is more gross, a small container for your spit or just letting your spit fall on the floor. Yeah, right, where it just absorbs into the carpet over, <laughs> right. over time. I mean, uh, anyway, she says, I think the little KSC mashed potato coleslaw containers would be ideal as they have a nice wide opening and a lid to contain the spit until you can empty it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Good, good suggestion, <laughs> brass players. That <laughs> so a, a good wide lid. I don't, I don't know what it, what it does to the aesthetic on stage to have those little containers on the ground. <laughs> but it can't be much worse than having people dumping spit everywhere. Yeah, seems like you should dump your spit before the performance. But well, now sometimes. But, but uh, what do I know? Well, she said that sometimes when spit builds up enough, it can actually, you know, affect the sound of the instrument, make it harder hey. to play. Yeah, it can it can gurgle. It yeah. can gurgle in there. I've, I've seen that. I don't know if I've, I mentioned that last time, but it, yeah, it, it, it can make a little kind of gurgly sound. It's not good. Very odd. Very odd. So, anyways, you got to get that out of there. And what do you do? You know. Yeah, I the, guess. The only other uh, another question that we had that she addressed was we were saying that in these spit valves can gather saliva and 
organic matter. I put up quotes with my hands. <laughs> but she cleared that up too. She said, try not to eat or drink or chew gum while pl- Try not to chew gum while playing. That's a big piece of organic matter. <laughs> uh, if that's even organic. And then she says, try not to eat or drink before playing. Okay, so if you eat a bag of Fritos and you go and blow yeah. a bunch of Frito crumbs into your trumpet... Yeah, you don't want to do that. Probably not good. You don't want to do that. You uh, you want to wash your mouth out also with water is suggested. She's suggesting wash mm-hmm. your mouth out with water before you play. Mm-hmm. That's the organic matter. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy Mitchell is a longtime listener and also a Patreon patron. She is. We, he- we heard her composition, and I think it was Listener Compositions episode one, maybe. Yeah. Okay, and then we have a new Patreon patron. Yeah, we have our friend Seth Woodell from British Columbia, Canada. Indeed. And Seth writes to us and says, if there was a question that I would really like to know more about, it would be orchestration. Well, look at that. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, we can talk about harmony forever, but when it comes down to a final composition, I think that orchestration is a whole other can of worms that can make or break a composition. Very true, Seth. Very true. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yet I almost know no theory on the subject. But there must be orchestration theory. Yes, there is. Uh, Right? Right. (laughs) Are there rules? Are there rules determining what timbres play well together and when? Does each section have bass, alto, tenor, etc.? And how do woodwinds orchestrate with brass or harp orchestrate whatever else? And what theory is there with regard to taking a composition of harmonies and blending it with the right instruments to get the right sound? Percussion? Do Hmm. levels and panning differ uh, for each type of instrument? Well, Hmm. you get the point. Uh, Thank you, Seth. Thank you for your uh, Patreon support. It is much appreciated. Thank you for that uh, uh, question and explanation. And the the short answer is you are right about all of that. Yes, there is absolutely a theory of orchestration. Mm-hmm. Far too often, this is a type of music theory that is ignored. Uh, it it is not considered part of, you know, quote unquote real. And I'm, I'm using pretty massive air quotes around the word real here. I see them. Um, not considered part of real quote unquote music theory which is generally assumed to be, as you say, the theory of harmony. Uh, but, but this is uh, absolutely an extremely impar- important part of being a good composer or, or a good um, or, or a knowledgeable musician. Uh, there are, um, I wouldn't call them rules. Remember, we're, we're not really big on rules necessarily. Uh, there are things to learn and things to consider in terms of how do woodwinds orchestrate with with uh, the brass or the harps or whatever else, uh, with uh, do do choirs have bass, alto, tenor? You know, the short answer to that is more or less. It gets a little complicated, but that's a that's a good basic uh, notation uh, idea. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, is is there a theory with regard to talking of a composition? of harmonies blending with the right instruments to get the right sound. 100% there is. 100%. There is a theory. There is an art. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what you're asking about, this is really an art. How do these harmonies, what instrument should I put these harmonies in to get the kind of sound that I want is, is really an art form. And you're in luck because uh, we are going to ignore this this field of music theory no longer, right? Uh, yes, sir. And actually, um, we'll talk about Patreon real quick. Um, Seth is a Patreon patron. If you if you, it's like a dollar, it's like a monthly subscription. So where if you, if you support us with a dollar, you get access to the site, which has bonus episodes. These bonus right. ep- these bonus episodes come from our five dollar donators like Seth who Mm -hmm. asks a question, and then we answer it on the Patreon site. Now, because Seth has asked such a universal question, we cannot just limit it to the Patreon site. So, Seth, you get another question, buddy, and we're going to take this and make it an actual 
official <laughs> episode, if not yeah, an official series of the episode. You, you, get, you get a free actual question for the for the Patreon site, which we will answer in no less than fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> but but yeah, this, uh, as Jeremy said, this question is really very universal, and we've always kind of meant to talk about it and just never have. Oh yeah. So uh, so uh, good a time as any, right? Indeed. And uh, before we get into this, um, Matt, in your lesson plan, you referred to a book, maybe a few books, uh, textbooks. I don't suppose maybe you... there are a lot actually. There are a lot of textbooks out there. Which is there one that you kind of use as a base? It's because some of our listeners are pretty serious about pursuing some of these texts. Are there any you can recommend for orchestration before we get into it? Absolutely, I can. The one I use in my class. Because it was the one my orchestration teacher used with us back in 19 whatever <laughs> when, when Jeremy and I met mm-hmm. uh, is the study of orchestration by Samuel Adler. That is A D L E R, the study of orchestration. Um, this is really, I consider this to be really the, the sort of the Bible of the art of orchestration. Um, it is, it is beautifully comprehensive. Not only does it go into great detail about, every individual instrument of the orchestra and even a few that don't show up very often, but it, it, it has a, a lot of chapters devoted to just how to work with these instruments together in, in combinations and, and, and um, how to consider the natural tendencies of these instruments as, as you, you write for all of them. So uh, to me, this is, this is hyper, uh, thorough it, and it, it is it is one of the best resources you'll ever have you know especially if you're if you're an aspiring composer or arranger or orchestra orchestral enthusiast of any kind now uh there are there are other there are other texts out there um uh there's actually believe it or not a text written by maurice ravel oh wow Yes, by the man himself. Now, obviously, that is a 19th century text, so it's a little antiquated. Uh, you, know, uh, you, you might have to sort of read a few passages two or three times to figure out what he's saying, just because his, his language by, by modern lexicons are, are kind of, is a little archaic. Uh, but, it, but, you know, nobody's going to uh, criticize Maurice Ravel's knowledge of orchestration, so that, that's definitely a good one. <laughs> Uh, uh, to check out too, and I've heard of other ones uh, 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 through the years, um, but uh, for my money, the uh, those are probably the two best. I, I really, you know, um, I'll try not to turn this into a commercial for Samuel Adler's textbook, but I really rely on this textbook and think this is one of the better resources out of all the textbooks I have. So. That's right. really saying something, too. I have a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, anyone who's read as many textbooks as you have, I would take that quite seriously coming from. Absolutely. Um, so, I, real quick, I kind of want to give a brief outline of what I think we're going to cover today, because I know we're okay. going to, we'll probably end up doing multi-part. We'll see, um, depending on time. Yeah, well, we definitely, I think this is going to turn into a four-part for strings, winds, brass, and percussion. At the very least, but we'll see if we can get things in all one so. episode. We're going to do a quick intro. Where we're going to kind of talk about where, where they fit in the orchestra and what they what their significance is. And we'll talk, talk a little bit about the proportions, the numbers, like how many you want to have in a proper full symphony orchestra. Mm-hmm. A little bit about construction, which we also covered in another episode. And then we might talk about a little bit about technique. We'll see how far we get after that, okay? Yeah. We, technique and Absolutely. then maybe some, some terms as far as glissando, vibrato, things you might see. On a score. Yeah. Things like that. Absolutely. And uh, since I know very little about this, I would say (laughs) the floor is yours, our good doctor. Okay. So where to begin? Well, first of all, if we're going to um, talk about orchestration in terms of the symphony orchestra and the film orchestra is not too far removed from from that conceptually. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have to uh, really begin by talking about the string family. By the string family, I mean the uh, people, you know, if you've ever ever been to see an orchestra concert live, 
you know, the, the people sitting in the front with violins and cellos and whatever else, uh, the song away, it's kind of cool to watch their bows go up and down at the same time. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of a neat thing to see. Uh, it's kind of hypnotic playing all the various string instruments. You'll notice that there are a lot of them. Right. Uh-huh. And these string instruments, uh, they're considered the backbone of the orchestra. Uh, they they play all the time. Oh yeah. Usually, uh, in uh, harmonies and things are played in at least the strings, and and other instruments will either uh, double what one of the string lines are doing, or you know will in you know maybe play one of those at the octave. There's other things you can do, but it, it is the the. The primary sort of force of the music, you know, the, the the strings are sort of considered considered the primary music players, and everybody else is is there to support with various timbres and you know uh, different sounds and whatever else. Uh, so they're sort of considered the backbone of the orchestra. This was especially true historically, you know, in the time of uh, the first person writing for what we would easily recognize as a, as an orchestra. Uh, Haydn to, you know, to uh, through Mozart and Beethoven. This is very, very much true. Schubert, Brahms, all of that. It becomes slightly less true as the orchestra gets bigger. You kind of, you know, the orchestra has a hit, an evolutionary history that you kind of have to talk about a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, but the strings came first. Uh, the strings were the very, very first instruments in that evolutionary uh, orchestra, and they're, uh, they're almost always playing. String players are very used to having to always playing. They're very used to, to to just you know sawing away for the whole concert. You know they don't. We don't really t- typically think of them as needing to rest the way we may think of trumpet players needing a rest every now and then, right? Is that um, because of their kind of soft tone color? They're kind of more or less mellow sound. I think it's just a historical evolutionary trait. Uh-huh. Uh, I, uh, the the very first thing that that even resembled an orchestra uh, that we know of in Europe uh, was uh, in the Baroque era, and it was Louis the Fourteenth's twenty four violins of the king. Ah, and uh, they they weren't all violins. That was just kind of a catchy name. There were violins and and some cellos and some other stuff, uh, but but they had that name, and that that is sort of the first sort of large multi more than 10 people playing kind of ensemble in history right and it was a string ensemble uh-huh so you know the strings they, they're even today they're thought of as almost always playing and and sort of the backbone of the orchestra because they just came first that was just sort of the first uh uh instrument family uh, we had and everything else got it got added on gradually uh, over the years and it, it's a little less true today you know but uh it's still um it, they, they're still a very very prominent family i mean you rarely hear a musical pra- passage in a film or an orchestra score where there are no strings playing ah. you know and they are very mellow they are also extraordinarily versatile you know i mean they can do a lot of different kinds of sounds can do them for a very very long time string players don't have to stop playing to breathe uh-huh. right Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, f- for all of these reasons, I think they, they become uh, sort of the primary instrumental family. Um, Question for you. Yes, sir. Now, I know we were talking about the range of this particular mm-hmm. section. The upright bass, I know, has um, E1 is the lowest note on most mm. of them, which is 41.2 hertz. But also some uprights have an extension to where you can... Indeed, they do. You can extend that low E to a low C. That would be C1, which is 32.7 hertz, right? Just about the lowest note of the orchestra. Just uh, about. Almost. So that I think the organ has maybe a couple of lower notes or maybe the piano. But the violin goes as high as um, C, I'm sorry, G7, which is 3136 3, hertz. Yeah, do you want to play a G7 on your keyboard just so you get a sense of how high that is? I want to say that's this guy. It's about right. And that's actually a little bit of a conservative est- estimate. You can play beyond the fretboard on a violin and get even higher. But Yeah, I mean, there's also this, I guess this is not really including harmonics or um, 
overtones. Yeah, yeah. This is just pure kind of general note ranges, you know, versus that C1 of the contrabass, if you want to play that note. Yeah, yeah. And this is not including harmonics or um, overtones, right? This is just the Correct. fundamental notes, you know. But um, compared to all the other sections, is this the greatest range? Like, I know you have tubas and you have piccolos. Um, um, that's a, that's have... a good question. It depends on how many of those instruments you want to include into the, you know, the, the piccolo actually plays an octave above written. So every note you're playing, you're actually hearing an octave above that. Yeah. So uh, that that's probably the highest pitched instrument in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, but the individual instruments of the string sections themselves uh, definitely have an exceptionally wide range. So uh, to take the example of the contrabass, you know, not only does it go um, all the way down to you know that that E that you were mentioning, or even the C below that but it can go all the way up to playing notes in the treble staff, right? Mm -hmm. So it's got a huge range. The cello famously has a huge range mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and sounds very smooth and warm across the entirety of its range. So it's, it's an extremely wide range instrument. It can play melodies, you know, it can play bass lines, you know, it can do uh, almost anything. The, the, violin you know it, its upper range is that g7 that, that that you play but its lower range is the g below middle c which is hopefully yeah yeah so these instruments have huge ranges have huge versatility you know um you're not going to worry about very much about getting uh you know getting outside of what they're they're physically capable of playing unless you're just making a really a really obvious mistake, you know, like mm -hmm. writing uh, violin music in the bass clef or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and and we'll get into all of that. If, if you're saying that thing, oh man, I didn't know not to do that. Don't don't worry. We'll 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 get into some of those basics. Um, all right. But yeah, the range is huge. Uh, their tone color is is largely homogenous, meaning their timbre doesn't change really much from the top of their range to the bottom of their range. Mm-hmm. It does change a little bit. If you've got good ears, you, you, can, you can detect the difference. But it can be very hard to, to, to detect a timbre change back and forth, you know, um, across their range. It can also be uh, a little hard to tell the difference between, you know, a cello playing middle C and a viola playing middle C. Uh -huh. you know, um, the, these two things are going to sound pretty similar compared to other instruments winds and brass and, and, and everything like that right mm -hmm. um it, it it's not that you can't tell a difference you 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 totally can but compared to those other instruments uh their their timbre is largely homogenous strings kind of sound stringy you know um mostly all the time unless you're doing something strange yeah um, the, the horns have a warmer sound in my mind than than the mm. um than the tube than the trumpets and so forth you know Right, yeah. So you so think about a cello it. playing middle C and a viola playing middle C and asking yourself, could you tell the difference? I mean, and the answer is yes, you could tell the difference. But, you know, it, think about by comparison, a, an oboe playing mm. middle C and a flute playing middle C. Uh huh. You know, that's not even a question you can tell the difference. Those two things sound completely different. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the cello and viola don't sound completely different in that way. Right. You, know, you, you think about a horn playing middle C and a trumpet playing middle C and you know, that probably doesn't sound as different as the, the oboe and flute, but it still sounds very, very different. You know? Relative to the string section. Relative okay. to the string. So, so homogenous tone color, very wide ranging dynamic ability, uh -huh. meaning they can play very soft or they can play very loudly. And this is not, affected very much by the range on the instrument you're playing in so a violin can play in its low registers loudly or softly and can play in its higher range, range registers loudly or softly with with about as much ease as opposed to a trumpet which uh asking a trumpet to play in its for example asking a trumpet to play in its higher register but play very very soft is extremely difficult to do and often becomes impossible, mm -hmm. right? It, it, when you're playing a trumpet, 
playing in its upper registers means the note's just going to be loud just by just by nature of the mechanics of that instrument whereas uh strings are agile with their dynamics this way so play loudly play softly you know play high play low you know these things are all kind of more independent of each other yeah which is probably another reason they're they're sort of remain the backbone of the orchestra right makes sense Absolutely. continuity yeah um sonic continuity yep uh they are uh a very they are very rich head tone like you said very rich the very warm you know, um, they're, they were, they're considered sort of the next closest thing to the actual human voice. Aha. Uh-huh. So they have a very rich, warm tone. Uh, they are capable of many different kinds of sounds, many very wide ranging, different kinds of sounds. You don't have to just bow them. There's also what we call pizzicato where they're being plucked. Mm-hmm. You know, there's also, uh, you can, uh, bow them towards the bridge and get a completely different sound. You can bow them towards, uh, the uh, the fingerboard and get a completely different sound. So so there's a lot of different kinds of you know you can bounce the bow versus versus, versus yeah. So there's a lot of different little things you can do to get very wide ranging sounds. And as we've already mentioned, they're capable of playing continuously. So hmm. for all of these reasons, you know they kind of become the orchestral backbone, right? Hmm. Uh, they they have the most sort of versatility in, in a number of different. Uh, uh, ways so they 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 make a good one to, to talk about first. Well, when you mentioned their similarity, to, I guess them being the closest to the human voice in terms of timbre, even um, mm-hmm. that to me supports the notion of why they might be more commonly used or the ones that play all the way through. There's just this familiarity that we have with those instruments, right? Yeah, and then well, when you the think other about ones... you know how do these things make sound? Um, a, a string instrument makes sound because as you as you rake the bow across the uh the string that sets the string vibrating and that's what creates the the, the sound right mm-hmm. um when you sing you are breathing air over your vocal cord which is you know uh it, it's kind of like a string right it's kind of it's cable shaped stretched to a certain point where it'll make a certain note and you blow air over it and that sets to vibrating mm-hmm. so it is a very similar way of making sound you know uh versus by comparison, something like the flute, right? Where you, it's the same thing as blowing across the top of a glass bottle. It's that same principle, you know, when mm. you split the column of air and, and, um, so, so yeah, it, it's, it's considered very natural. It's considered, they're considered very, uh, sing, singing like and, and voice like. It's kind of funny. They're, they're often associated, um, in, in film scores and, and movie scores and TV scores, what have you. Uh, they're often uh, associated with this kind of romance. Mm-hmm. You know? um, they used to be the instruments of emotion. You know, Stravinsky talked about them as, as instruments that had inherent emotion just in their timbres. And in the dynamic range, I imagine, because uh, they can swell, you know, they can. Yeah, go- absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It seems like nowadays the music of a, the, the instrument of emotion is the piano. Whenever mm-hmm. you're watching a tv show or movie or something and a really sad or emotional part comes along you hear a piano playing yeah. seems like that connotation is kind of shifting you know as, as the decades go by but uh which which is interesting to me but but yeah they're they're um for these reasons very very integral to the to the uh to the to the orchestral makeup the backbone of, of the orchestral sound really so much so that when you have every other choir and don't have strings, you officially do not have an orchestra. Then you call it a little wind band. You know, oh, that's or, interesting. Or some kind of band. Right? That is interesting. It's only an orchestra if it has a string section. Good to know. Wow. Okay, so that makes sense as, as to why they're so significant. Um, now let's talk about if you were to try and arrange, or try to put together an orchestra, or, or how you would say that. What are the, some of the proportions that uh, are All right. the standard proportions or what? Yeah, yeah, proportions, good, uh, good word. Uh, well, these have changed historically, uh, like everything in the orchestra. It started off being pretty small and got bigger. Um, as we said earlier, there are a lot of string players in an orchestra. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason for this, uh, somewhat uh, anecdotally, but it is true, is that it takes a strings, individual string instruments tend to be sort of soft, right? Mm-hmm. And it takes a certain number of violins 
to be capable of playing as loudly as a single trumpet. Right? Oh, so soft and sound compared to soft and timbre. Right. Right. Soft. Yeah. Soft and sound, like like volume level, volume amplitude level. level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's uh, you know, it, it, there's it, it takes more than one violin to be able to to match on just a a pure audible level the, the sound of a single trumpet. You know, mm -hmm. you put in an orchestra with two or three trumpets, it's going to take even more violins. Right. 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 Uh, same thing with, with, with flutes. And so um, the way the strings are usually works is they're divided into sections. Okay. There are, there are the first violins, which usually have about 16 to 18 violins, violinists in them, right? Seems all like a lot. Play, all typically playing the same part. Now, I say typically because not always. Uh, you can do very creative things about having them half play one part and half play another or whatever. But uh, traditionally, you know, typically they play uh, 16 or 18 violin players that are all playing one melody or one melodic part or playing the soprano note, the highest note in the chord or what have you. Right. Mm -hmm. But but the idea is they make up one sort of voice. Uh, you have another 14 to 16 violinists that are the second violins sort of playing an alto-ish part. Right. Uh, same situation. Generally, they're all playing the same thing. Um, then you have uh, 10 to 12 violas. And a viola is kind of like a violin, but it's bigger and it plays lower. So it's a, an alto-ish to tenor-ish kind of instrument. Can do can do either. Remember, huge range in all of these. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you will have anywhere from 10 to 12 cello players. Uh, and by cello, we mean the violoncello. Pretty much everybody knows what a cello is, but it's um, typically considered the bass instrument of the string family. Um, why is the bass not considered the bass instrument of the, the string family? Well, mm -hmm. you will also, in addition to those, have eight to ten contrabass players. Contra bass being the same thing as the upright bass that we know from jazz. You know, if you're a jazz instrument, instrumentalist or whatever, um, you will have eight to ten of those playing it bowed. The contra bass plays the bass part, but it actually transposes an octave down. So when you see the note B flat, you know, uh, second line on the bass clef for a contra bass player, they'll play that B flat, but the note that actually is coming out of their instrument is going to be the B flat and octave down from that. Mm. So they're brought on to double the cello part in places where you just really, really want a lot of oomph and a lot of weight, you know, and you know, just wanted 10 pounds added to the sound. You know? I see. Um, over the years, they've been used more creatively than that. They've, been, they, they've gained a certain amount of independence from the cello. They don't just reinforce the cello, but, but their traditional role was to reinforce the cello, which is the main bass instrument of the orchestra. As I look at these numbers and proportions, it appears, like you said, 16 to 18 on the first violins, 14 mm -hmm. to 16 on the second violins. Mm -hmm. um, and as we go lower, we're adding less instruments like 10 mm -hmm. to 12 violas, 10 to 12 cellos, and finally mm -hmm. 8 to 10 basses. Mm -hmm. And I guess, is that because the bass frequencies carry a little further? Because they carry a little further because the cellos and basses are bigger, which means they have bigger sound boxes, which means they amplify more. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's just trying to keep in proportion so that everything, every instrument, not only in the strings, but in the orchestra in general, has the same chance to sort of be at the front of the musical texture if it needs to be and isn't going to be drowned out by everything else. Okay. Okay, continue, no. please, and I'll have a one no, more. You can, you can do bad orchestration and drown stuff out, but it, it, it won't be <laughs> yeah. because your proportions are wrong, hopefully. I see, I see. That would be rather in your composition technique or your uh, lines, <laughs> your music. Right, yeah. Well, that's something to yell at your conductor about because they're usually in charge of those kind of things. They're the sound <laughs> mixer, right? They're the sound mixer and the drum player. Yeah. Now, in practice, of course, it can often be smaller than that. When you're recording a film score and you're in a studio, there's not always a big need to have 18 first violins and 16 second or whatever for the sake of sound, you know, you can just have three or four and mic them, right? Ah, yeah, right. You know, so for, for a lot of kinds of reasons like that, it can often be smaller. Some orchestras just don't have the budget to hire that many people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, that, that's just 
the nature of, of the world we live in. So for, for many reasons, it can often be smaller than that. It's rarely larger than that. Uh, bigger than that, and you're talking about one heck of a huge orchestra, right? But yeah, but as you size up or size down, you must maintain the proper ratios, right? Ideally. Ideally, yeah. Ideally. Now, you know, high school student orchestras, you know, sometimes they have what they have, you know. <laughs> They, they may have 20 first violins and four cellos. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's a shame, but, you know, you, you, you take what you can get. Ideally, though, you, you want those proportions to remain roughly mm-hmm. correct, you know, roughly Very right. Cool. And then another quick question um, for you. Mm-hmm. You said that the first violins, um, okay, I guess maybe it's a two-part question. Now, you said there's first violins and second violins. I remember there was first tenor and second tenor and things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, are they typically dedicated lines to these two sections? Like the second, would the first and second violins ever be playing the same lines? They can. Okay. Uh, the, the the first and second violins could be playing the same lines, but they are thought of as two independent orchestral parts. Entities. Yeah, they're, they're considered two different entities, yeah. And then um, as far as the division, so... Uh, if you have all of your first violins playing one melody, it's mm-hmm. going to be a certain volume level because there all these uh, frequencies are being reinforced by the others around them. But right. if you go off and do a harmony, does that do you have to worry about? Do you have to ask them to play louder if you split into a harmony on just the first violins? Because sonically, I mean, it might actually be quieter if you're not playing all right, the same yeah. note. Um, that's actually something you have to take into account as an orchestrator. Uh-huh. Uh, th- this is where this is where the art of orchestration comes in. Uh, they really can't play as loud if if half of them are playing one note and half of them are playing another note, right? Mm-hmm. They spread it um, thin. They they spread it a little thin. So yeah, uh, that that's something you kind of have to take into account. Is that you'll get much better projection if all of the violins are playing uh, a single note versus you know the the Davisi, which we'll talk about later. You know. Um, much uh, much uh, higher projection if the first violins have a note, the second violins have a note, you know, the violas have a note, and the cellos have a note, and then the bass, contra bass, double the cello and octave down. That's going to be a pretty powerful chord. Mm-hmm. It's only going mm-hmm. to be a four voice chord, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, think about, you know, I mean, you know, all, all Western classical music really is four voices at the end of the day, but uh, but but yeah, you know th- these are these are things you have to have to consider. You know, maybe be, you know if you want more notes than that, maybe better that to leave the string sections and uh, doing one note a piece and have other notes being played in the trumpets or horns. Ah uh-huh, yes, or flutes we or still... something that we're not going to talk about just yet. Right? Yeah, right. This is but this is where the art of orchestration comes in. It's a good question. It's a very good question. This, wow. These are the kind of things that that good orchestrators like John Williams, you know, or Beethoven, these are the kind of things they're thinking about where, you know, people who's maybe not the greatest orchestrators in the world aren't giving these kind of things serious consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And also uh, last thing about the numbers is typically all of the, all of the players in a given section, first violins, violas, whatever, they're typically all playing the same part. They typically play two to a stand uh, a music stand, right? A music stand. Uh, so if you have if you have sixteen violinists, then you're going to have eight music stands, and you know everyone will have two uh, musicians sitting, uh, sitting there playing off of that stand, sitting next to each other playing off that stand. So they're sort of aligned in rows down to going towards the back of the stage. So these are some setup th- considerations we have to take into mind, right? Setup considerations, yes. Um, Stage if plot. there's not a if there's not a convenient page turn, uh, and there's often not, you know, is is thought of that the um, person uh, furthest from the audience, not the one the closest to the audience, but oh. the person furthest from that, will stop playing to turn the page. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. That is brilliant. Yeah, because it's also obscured. generally thought that the person to the right, i.e. The closest to the audience is considered the better player. Might be a little better, right. although that's not necessarily. I mean, when you're talking about when you're talking about like the Boston Pops or, or the New York Philharmonic or something, 
everybody's everybody's an outstanding player. That's not much of a consideration, right? But you just flip a coin. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, the first chair, first violinist sitting on the right of the very first stand in front of the conductor, that is the concert master. Uh-huh. And he, he is definitely responsible of being kind of the sort of the the second in command to the conductor and sort of the uh, uh, the executive in charge of the string section, right? He's mm-hmm. the one that gets everybody bowing in the same direction in their parts, why their bows all go up and down at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the one that says, hey, we're going to bow it this way yeah, so that so that everybody's in, in in unison. That that's part of his job. So this is uh, part of his job is to sort of communicate, help communicate the desires of the conductor to the string sections. So you're saying when we're watching the some of that is pre-scripted. He'll actually say, "Okay, we're going to start at the frog end of the bow on this part." Oh yeah, all together. Right. That's the guy that. Okay, that's interesting. Or the girl it's, that is all entirely scripted. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, oh, so and then my other question was that's so that's the difference between first chair and second chair. Second chair is the page turner. First chair is closer to the crowd. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I was always curious about that, too. Yep. 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 Yeah. One more thing before we move into the next little uh, section of this discussion. Our friend Seth was asking about panning, right? Right. Is this is this a good time to discuss where these things go in the stereo field? Like if you're looking at the actual you know right yeah left, well right. you know when you're sitting in uh most concert halls they tend to be pretty ambient places uh-huh you know so so it, it's not like you're going to detect a whole lot of you know um uh uh, uh variation in panning separation in a live setting yeah um i know a lot of film scores in their mix do like to sort of set yeah you know, um uh, violins one and two, you know, one panned pretty far to the left and the other one panned a little bit to the left to sort of mimic where they would be in the orchestra mm-hmm. just to get a little bit of separation. Sure. You know? That's um, what I would do. Uh, bass instruments tend to go straight up and down still, you know. Yeah, right. That's what I would do too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's and that's just that that that's just the art of good mixing really, you know. Um, and, you know, in a, in a, in a concert hall, you know, those, those bass frequencies are so huge. It's not like you can detect that it's coming from a particular direction. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, um, so, so generally, uh, uh, I don't give a whole lot of thought to panning, you know, unless I were to be mixing an orchestra and really that's more, that's more Jeremy's field than mine. So he's <laughs> probably got a better sense of how that should go. Yeah. I can mix for bass, guitar and drums pretty good, <laughs> <laughs> but I've never, I would Not love, like you I have would, any experience doing that at all. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I would really love to get my hands on an orchestral piece that you can actually mix. That would be fun. That would be fun. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about, um, I see here in your notes, you have construction is up next. And, um, I do want to reference episode 57 where we actually talk about, uh, instrument care part one, mm-hmm. that was the strings. We actually talked about that and we do go into a little more detail about the build and the construction. But let's hit some of these real quick if you, if you want to. Yeah. Okay. Just real, real quickly, just, just sort of a little bit of a review about strings. Um, the proportions to all the string instruments are the same. What varies is the size. So if you're looking at a picture of a string instrument, uh, you can't tell unless there's something there to compare it to whether it's a violin, a viola, a cello, or a double bass, because the proportions are all the same. The only thing that, that, that differs is the size of those instruments. Uh-huh. Violins are the smallest, cello, you know, followed by the viola, which is just a little bit bigger. And then the, you know, the cellos are big enough that, you know, you have to play it between the knees. And then of course the bass, you kind of have to stand up and play. Right. Yeah. Oh. But it's like you're saying, you can almost take a shrink ray to um, an upright and the result would be these other stringed family instruments. They have a very uniform kind of look to them. Absolutely. And I wonder that probably um, contributes to the, the sound being so similar, right? What do you say? It, it may, I've never really thought about it, but, but the, it, the it may, it may. Absolutely. Um, the body is made of wood, as you know, and is hollow. So the, the sound of the strings goes into the hollow body, you know, and bounces around out there and comes out, you know, in, in an amplified state. So it's sort of like a natural amplifier, right? Yes. Um, 
the uh, the neck is convex, and this is this is a big thing for for guitar players who maybe never played with uh, a violin or anything. Uh, by convex, we mean the neck the the strings are actually arched, mm-hmm. so they're not all laying f- they're not all stretched flat, completely equidistant from each other in height. Right. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's a little there's a little arch where the the middle two strings are higher than the two on the end. So yeah, the the layout on the bridge is kind of curved, and the and the mm-hmm. neck follows that layout to where mm-hmm. it curves. And you say it's convex, meaning that it curves upwards from from yeah. the yeah. Only two can be play. Only two strings generally are played at the same time uh-huh. because that really generally the most basic string technique is to play only one string at a time, only one note at a time. Uh-huh. Uh, playing what we call double and triples and quadruple stops, meaning playing more than one string, is uh, sort of an advanced technique. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, what about the, uh, as far as the tuning is concerned, the arrangement of the the, um, the strings? The so the the violin has these four strings. Okay. Four str- and just like the guitar, those four strings are tuned to specific particular notes right Mm -hmm. so that if we played if we bowed either any of those strings without doing anything on our left hand at all without putting our fingers left hand fingers to the instrument at all we would play these four particular notes you know assuming our instrument is in tune Mm -hmm. those notes are the g below middle c the d that is a perfect fifth above that the a that is a perfect fifth above that and then the E that is the perfect fifth above that. Tuned in fifths. Tuned in fifths. Fifths going up. Uh, G D A E, which is just uh, which which is just mental torture to bass players because of course the bass is E A D G. Right. We're gonna talk about that in a second. That <laughs> yeah. Is weird. Um, the v- and that's those are the the violins. The first violin is the second violin. So there's this is the same instrument. Okay, so that's the highest of the stringed instruments. Yes, the viola. Hmm is a perfect fifth below that. So its lowest string played open is the C that is an octave below middle C. The G that is a perfect fifth above that. The D that is a perfect fifth above that. And the A that is a perfect fifth above that. The A, okay. Yep. A440. Tuned, tuned in fifths. The cello is tuned an octave below the viola. Aha. So its lowest string is the C, two octaves below middle C. That sounds pretty low, yeah. but that sounds right. Yeah. Two ledge lines below the bass clef, right? Mm-hmm. The, and then the G that is an octave above, or a perfect fifth above that is the second string. Third string is a D that is the perfect fifth above that. And then the A that is a perfect fifth above that is the cello's highest string. Got it. You know, I actually could have played that on my cello because I have it sitting right here in case I have to use it. <laughs> Assuming it's in tune, right? Assuming it's in tune. Uh, it's a, assuming hey. your instrument is well tuned, these, thing, the, these things hold true. I sat there for 15 minutes trying to tune that thing, and hopefully it is at least somewhat in tune. Yeah. And the bass, uh, the, the bass has c- is, is got an interesting sort of alternative history from the rest of them. But, mm-hmm. but f- because of that, it is uh, tuned differently. It is actually tuned in fourths. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you know any bass players, I don't think I do. Uh, but it, it, it's just like the electric bass that you, that you see in, in uh, rock and roll and in popular music and all that. It is tuned E... A, D, and G. And if you want to get an earful of that lower C extension, there it yeah. is. Oh. And that low, that low C will, will, will bring it down to what we call great C. Yeah, it's, great uh, C, huh? Yeah. And those, uh, f- those uh, six-string basses can go down to this low B, right? <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. Uh, five and six string basses, yeah, absolutely. It does interest me that the uh, that the bass is tuned in fourths, why the other ones are tuned in fifths. All the other stringed instruments are tuned in fifths. Um, can you do you have any insights on why that is? The bass is actually from a different type of string family. Mm. 
So back even before the Baroque, even before Louis the Fourteenth and the Twenty Four Violins of the King and all that stuff, uh, back in the Renaissance, when c- uh, constructed instruments were first becoming a part of European music, you know, up until then everything was just song, right? Uh-huh. Uh huh. You would have consorts. You, you would have these things called consorts, and what a consort was was just a soprano alto tenor bass version of one instrument the recorder for example a recorder concert would be a soprano recorder an alto recorder recorder a tenor recorder and a bass recorder right hmm. <laughs> i'd like to hear that one such family yeah uh, you say that now <laughs> <laughs> one such family of instruments was the viol uh-huh. not the violin the viol and the viol family soprano alto tenor and bass were tuned in for us and what we now call the contrabass is actually um a descendant of that family it is technically called a bass viol Mm -hmm. v-i-o-l as opposed to the violino family where we get the the violino aka the violin uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, the braccia, the the arm, which which we later would translate as the viola, you know, hmm. and uh, the 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 dear violon, uh, the 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 violoncello, and but yeah, those are those are from a different family than the you know the 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 contrabass is sort of their adopted child from a different family of string instruments way back in the Renaissance. I see. I see. Well, um, I think there's still enough to be said, enough more to be said about these instruments, uh, the string section, to do this in a two-part orchestration. I think uh, so. Maybe 1A and 1B or something. Something like that. I don't know. We'll figure out how to, how to actually say it. Um, if, it's, if it's orchestration part one, strings A and strings B, or just orchestration, we can figure that out later on. We'll figure that out, yeah. <laughs> um, but before we, before we go, because we still have to talk about technique and... Um, some other little things but like that. Terms, things you might see on a score regarding how to play. Bowing. Yep. I, think, I think we can get a good stout episode part two. But before we get out of here, I do have another question for you yes. today. Um, are there particular roles in terms of, I don't even know what the right word is, like personifying the instrument, you know what I mean? Like, for example, in, in, in opera, the tenor, right. the, tenor the, the, the guy who sings high is usually the, the hero. The soprano who sings high is usually the the one he's saving or whatever. Yeah, the fair the, maiden and, the, and all of this. The yeah. baritone is usually the bad guy, you know. Yeah, and the bass is usually the idiots for some reason. The the, the comic relief, right? Where the tuba comes in when it bomb, bomb, yeah, bomb, yeah, bomb. Yeah. So, yeah, is, is there something to be said about that? Um, how how might you or, or how might you orchestrate for different moods, and do these instruments play a part? There is absolutely something to be said about that. Uh, there is, um, you know, so, you know, you, you point out that like, for example, in opera, you know, the, the, the tenor is, is very often the heroic lead. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and like the, the bass is usually the comic, you know, it is sort of the sort the bumbling count or, or whatever, <laughs> the, the father of the, you know, and, and, you know, they kind of have the, the, they tend to occupy these, these roles. Um, in actual instrumental music, orchestral music, uh, there is actually a very large, almost tacit tradition of the very same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is spoken of so little in music theory that um, the only good word I ever heard uh, for it was from a, a Russian music co- uh, Russian musicologist. Hmm. Um, his, his name was, uh, uh, Asiyev, and he called them an internazia, uh-huh. uh, a, a musical thing that, that was just symbolic of, of something else, you know, conjured up images, you know, performing, you know, uh, had a, had a psychological significance or weight to it, you know? Hmm. Um, so, you know, for example, like, uh, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, if you're, if you're, uh, writing orchestral music and you want to conjure up the image of butterflies, you might have the piccolos going, you know, yeah. uh, whereas, you know, the, the, um, 
the tuba is sort of the drunken, you know, uh, drunken uh, guy stumbling around or whatever, you know. You know, that makes me think about, remember the cartoon for Peter and the Wolf that they did? Disney did a mm-hmm. little yeah. cartoon. And you had the big old grandfather, bum, bum, ba, bum. <laughs> right, yeah. You know that he's uh, someone's in trouble when that right. guy comes along. <laughs> And yeah, they actually did a good job. That cartoon itself actually did a good job of kind of showing how, I guess maybe the what was the duck, the oboe, oh, the, cl- the clarinet, the clarinet, yeah. which one was more, more nasal. I mean, they all had kind of personifications. They, yeah, well, they had uh, different instruments associated with different characters. And and minif- and animalifications. Yeah, Peter and the Wolf is a is a very good is a very basic sort of introduction into the ideas that. Um, you're already an expert on whether you know it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, uh, the trumpet, ever since it has been a part of the orchestra, and, and before that, going back to probably Julius Caesar, when you know he was, he would be announced. His interest would be announced with with the you know, uh, uh, three or four trumpets blaring, mm-hmm. has been associated with a hero, right? And fifth, yeah. Only on a trumpet. Epically associated with a hero. Mm-hmm. And it, w- it has been associated with heroes in tone poems, like uh, Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, you know, which is, is not sung. It's just an orchestral piece. But, huh. you know, uh, and, and it's, it's um, been associated with heroes in Wagner offers. It has been associated with heroes in Michael Bay movies. Go back and watch the Transformers and oh, listen gosh. to what instrument – Optimus Prime's main theme is played on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what instrument do you think the Luke Skywalker theme is Star Wars? Da, 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 da. You first hear that in the trumpets. It is it is an uh, an instrument associated with heroism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th- whereas the horn has has a great tradition of being associated with um nature and uh pastoral scenes and and uh hunting and, and all of these things, you know. But a lot of those do have uh, textual, uh, timbral differences, right? Where sure. it, as far as the stringed instruments are concerned, I guess we're just talking about the contrabass, cello, viola, and violin. Uh, right, yeah. The, the, the strings specifically are often just sort of thought of as the music. So the string, it's, it's like know, the string it, section, right? It's Yeah, but you know, like, I, like I said at the beginning, the strings for a long time are sort of the music of emotion. Mm-hmm. Whenever there is a very emotional thing going on, you would hear the strings. You know, think about the score to, you know, those old uh, those old movies from the fifties. You know, Doctor Zhivago and and things like that. You, mm-hmm. know? you know, whenever the the strings would swell, it would be at a big emotional time. Um, and uh, the the you know the the violin is is considered a very lyrical instrument. It's often it's often thought of as as something that, that's played, you know, with a lot of emotion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the cello too. The cello has often been used to to, to uh, represent kind of darker emotions. I liken it to the tenor and the soprano, right? Mm-hmm. Same kind of positions. Sure. Same kind of yeah, um, yeah. The, the, these role these roles go across a lot of the Western music tradition, which is an inherently narrative tradition, right? I mean, we 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 create music designed to tell stories. And and so uh, uh, the, these kind of associations with different narrative roles, uh, you, know, it, it, you almost would expect nothing less. And and yeah, they absolutely do happen. And you know, you dear listener are more of an expert on this than you think, mm-hmm. because uh, the these uh, intonatia they they still inform a lot of the film score to. Star Wars to Lord of the Rings to oh, yeah. Harry Potter, uh, yeah. to to a lot of where we where most people hear orchestral music in this day and age, which is, which is in movies, which is in the films. Yeah. So you, yeah. you you know you know more about this than than you think. the uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, hmm. uh, the Fellowship theme is a combination of horns and trumpets. Oh, so. Yeah? Not only heroes, but heroes of the natural world, heroes that sprang from the organic forest world, which is right in keeping with uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, ideas about his heroes and villains. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool that they take those 
those uh, texture things into consideration when they're talking about the stories and the themes and things like that. It's, Oh yeah, if they're good, if they're good, if they're good, you know, and, and and this is you know this, this is where we start to think about well, hmm, how do we know a good film composer from from you know perhaps a more mediocre one? Well, these are the kind of things he, they are taking into consideration when they go to write their score. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, it, it's easy enough to you know uh, orchestrate in a way that is you know functional, that is acceptable. That, yeah. that will you know that, that will get your you know melodies out there that will be playable on all the instruments you know that's taught easily enough the, it is in it is in these things that the real orchestration happens mm-hmm. the things we're talking about today the very things the very things well before we get out of here i think it is uh, customary to do a recap yes now we started off just thanking our wonderful listeners and our reviewers <laughs> and our Patreon patron Seth Woodell. Mm-hmm. But then we went in and we kind of talked about this, the purpose or the uh, where they sit, their significance. Just uh, hit me again one more time. Okay. So strings, uh, the backbone of the orchestra, almost constantly playing in most orchestral music. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, they are. They have a huge range. The individual instruments can go from very low to very high within their range. Uh, they are ha- have a homogenous timbre. They sound very similar to each other, uh-huh. tone color wise. Uh, wide dynamic range that is unaffected by pitch. Which is uh, vo- volume, right? Right, right, right. Uh, uh, played loudly or played softly and, and at any pitch level. Rich tone, many different kinds of sounds. And they can sound almost continuously. Mm-hmm. In a complete symphony orchestra, you will have at least 16 to 18 first violins mm-hmm. playing the highest violin part, typically, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, at least 14 to 16 second violins, 10 or 12 violas, 10 or 12 cellos, 8 to 10 basses. In practice, it can often be smaller than that, but but that's that's considered sort of standard. These in- these instruments typically play two to a stand, two people playing off one music stand with music on it. Uh huh. Um, the they they are all of similar proportions, meaning the size changes. The cello and bass are much bigger, and the viola and violin are smaller, uh, but the proportions are exactly the same. If you look at the instrument, they look like the same instrument. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the body is wooden and hollow. Uh, with sound holes that amplify the sound. The neck is arched, you know, mm-hmm. meaning really no more than two can be played at the same time. You'd really have to press down hard on that bow and those strings to get more than two to go at the same time. Right, yeah. The uh, the open strings, the violin is tuned G, D, A, E, starting with the G that is uh, the G below middle C and going up a perfect fifth with each open string. Mm-hmm. G, D, A, E. The viola is the C that is below that, uh, 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 C, G, D, A. Building on perfect fifths. Right. The cello is an octave below that, C, G, D, A, that, that is the uh, starting at the C that is two octaves below middle C. Mm-hmm. And then the bass is kind of from a different family, so it's kind of E, A, D, G. You know, mm-hmm. It's tuned in fourths, just like the electric bass is. Right, yeah. And then we talked a little bit about... Uh, that's as far as we got. That's as far as we got. How's that for a recap? <laughs> How's that for a recap? <laughs> Lightning round. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, I think that, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have plenty more to say about this. And I don't know about you, Matt, but I think that we could just get right into it after this episode, maybe. Let's I, do that. Unless you want to do a history thing or something. But I feel like we're in a groove here, and I think uh, it might be cool to continue it. A lot of times we do part one, then we do several other things. Yeah, let, yeah, let's just go back into it. You just want to do this next? Uh, yeah. Get on into it. Okay, great, great. Sounds like a plan. And uh, Matt, I want to give you a shout out for your uh, for your music on the intro and the outro. Oh, thank you. You don't know what it is. I don't either. I, I don't. <laughs> but I, I know it'll be strings, and I know it's going to be cool. We haven't really picked the music yet, but um, I do plan on using you because you have... We've been listening to a lot of your music lately, and I'm very happy about that, actually, Matt. Oh, well, I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, the exposure, as, <laughs> as, as it were. Yeah, um, I've got to write more stuff so you don't have to hear, play the same things all the time. You really do. You really do. <laughs> i got to get on that. <laughs> but um, 
whatever we're hearing, I'm sure it's awesome because I wouldn't use it if it wasn't. Isn't that right? <laughs> and won't use it if it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, guys, for listening. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get right back into it. Yep. Stay safe out there. Take care. Given that entire textbooks are written on this topic, there's still plenty more to say. So keep on listening, and we'll keep on talking. If you've got questions or comments, send them in to info at musicstudent101.com.